If you're up to the challenge, heading west to hunt mule deer can be an unforgettable experience. Mule deer on a whitetail hunting show? What are we thinking? Well, I'm gonna tell you what we're thinking. Mule deer and whitetail, they're basically the same deer. Black tails on the west coast, white tails on the east coast, they met in the middle, they had little mule deer babies. And today, that species has set up a home territory in the Great Plains all the way, almost to the Pacific coast. There are a number of tactics for locating muleys, but the most popular is spot and stalk. This is not sitting in tree stands for hours on end, hoping a deer is gonna walk into bow range. Spot and stalk requires not only being in shape, but it also requires a different way of approaching how you're hunting. It's looking out vast areas, hundreds of yards, even miles, and trying to spot a deer that might be sitting out there, might be bedding out there. Completely different ball game. Lace up your boots and grab your gun. We're going mule deer hunting. is Land of white tailed Okay, so we're talking mule deer. You know, you go out to a lot of these western states and they have both. They have white tails and mule deer, and you get a tag that you can hunt either or on the same tag. That's pretty cool. One thing you need to realize though is when you get out there, although there might be white tails and mule deer on the same property, these species normally live segregated. White tails on one side of the canyon, mule deer on the other side of the canyon. It's pretty remarkable. You could be in an area where you see 30, 40, 50 white tails, you go up over the next hill, it's all mule deer. I think the difference between hunting western white tails and, and, and hunting western mule deer really isn't so much a difference but between the species as much as it is how they use the terrain. Um, white tails seem to gravitate more towards the river bottoms. Uh, muleys are animals of the big wide open. They like it out in the prairies. That's not to say you won't find white tails out in the open because you will too. So there's not a lot of difference. There's some subtle differences between hunting mule deer and hunting white tails out, out in the west. But you can hunt both species in the same areas. And that's the beauty of it too. A lot of states will allow you to hunt either species. So you might be targeting white tails, but then you see that gag or mule deer and you just have to pull the trigger. The cool thing and educational thing about hunting mule deer is the wide open spaces aspect. Because let's face it, you know, 90% of us are hunting in woods and hunting in close situations and hunting maybe where you have, if a hundred yard shot presents itself, that's a far shot. In mule deer country, this is completely different. So if you've never hunted mule deer, I highly suggest it just for the fact that it's gonna make you a better deer hunter in general. Because when you're hunting that open terrain, there's certain things that you're gonna learn how to do that you're gonna be able to apply to where your hunting situation is. You know, mule deer and whitetails, they're deer, right? They both live and die by their noses and their eyes. And that's what's cool about watching mule deer and observing their behavior is their eyesight and their nose is just as good as any whitetail. And they're doing it from much farther distances because when you're hunting mule deer, normally you're talking in hundreds of yards, three, four, five, six hundred yards where you might see that deer and you might have to decide, am I gonna take a shot or not? That's another topic as far as whether you're ready to do that. Because most of us, if we grow up in the Midwest or the Northeast or even the Southeast, a hundred yard shot is a long shot. Out there, you're not gonna get a hundred yard shot. And a mule deer, if you do, that's a slam dunk. So mule deer, you have to learn how to outsmart their noses and outsmart their eyesight. And to do this, what you do is you use the topography. And somebody said, well, it's wide open, they can see you. Not so much, when you get out there, there's little wrinkles in the topography that you can use to your advantage to spot and stalk and get closer to the deer. And that's what's really cool about mule deer hunting is it really teaches you how to be a better woodsman and that's gonna make you a better deer hunter in the end. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by 
Cuddyback, more deer, fewer blanks. Analogics, protect your herd with the power of science. Thompson Center, America's master gun makers. Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. And by Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology. Apply, dry it, and go hunt. Coming up next, Mark Kaiser heads to South Dakota. It's a land of whitetail and mule deer. Tough choice, or maybe not, when you see this walk out. This is Land of Whitetail TV. If you are a Midwest or Eastern deer hunter, you really owe it to yourself to make a Western hunt part of your bucket list. It's still deer hunting, but completely different than what you see from a tree stand. If there are two things that are important when going out for mule deer hunting, number one, glass, gotta have good optics. Number two, glass, gotta have great optics. And let's throw another one in there, glass. You gotta have good optics. Don't go out there with a cheap pair of binoculars. Get yourself a good pair of binoculars. It makes all the difference. Patience is key. You have to be patient when hunting mule deer because it could get hot during the day. These deer are laying down, you're not gonna see them. So you might be sitting there for hours and hours and hours glassing the same spot, boom, deer stands up. That's when you have to be ready. Mark Kaiser has an offer to hunt western South Dakota in the heart of the Badlands. Out here, he has the chance at a whitetail or a mule deer. It's a tough choice, and Mark being Mark, he's chasing the whitetail first. I got to the ranch late that very first day. Instead of just gathering a whole bunch of gear, trying to assemble everything together, our host said, why don't you just follow us out to a point, sit there and glass for a little bit, see what's out on these fields. There were food plots, there was a lot of river bottom habitat to look at, and really there wasn't enough time to put a stalk together. Sitting there, I was more than pleased. But I was really surprised when a big mule deer buck stepped out from a eroded gully. He waddled out. Actually, he was limping, following a hot doe. And he had some uh, young competition, but they weren't really ready to tussle with the big boy. He held the area as his own dominant zone. That big buck, he hobbled along, but he gave me plenty to think about that night. Was he a shooter? Should I return there the next day with my rifle? Or look elsewhere? Because we were on a ranch that had tens of thousands of acres of hidey holes to investigate. What we're gonna do here is slip through some cover, do a little bit more recon. I'm not seeing the whitetail numbers that I had hoped to see in this hunt or in this area. So we're gonna go into the cover, right into the bedding area. I do this a lot this time of the year when the deer are rutting, they're dispersed, uh, they're a little bit, you know, less attentive to what's going on. We're gonna do a little rattling, a little grunting, a little just glass, see if anybody's home and try to get an idea. Is the deer density good in here or should we be focusing more on the mule deer up in the brakes? Unfortunately, the big bucks, they just weren't showing themselves. Were they there, were they not? Well, my suspicions were they were there. They were just holed up with the last few hot does of the season. Any day now, the rut was about to shut down. The next day, well maybe it was time to take a look at the mule deer country and hike into the brakes. After time well spent chasing the whitetail, Mark is changing gears. He loves mule deer hunting, and being a Western hunter, he knows all about the tactics needed. He is ready. Like many ranches, roads crisscrossed all throughout the edges, the fields, even into the breaks. That's a good way to scout. It's a good way to put your spotting scope to use, and I did that. But when it comes time to find a mature buck, yeah, it's time to lace up the boots and put some miles on. Head into the back country, Don your backpack, pack a lunch, and spend the day. I did just that in an area they referred to as the Badlands. Remember that limpy buck that I described at the beginning of this hunt? Well, this was on the edge of his territory. There was a chance we'd find him in there, but I knew he wouldn't be the only buck. Deer were going in and out of there as they left the cottonwood bottoms, the food plots, the fields. This was their refuge rough, 
jagged, eroded gullies, big canyons, places a mule deer buck could disappear, and you or I would never see them again. A hunting trip west offers some of the best opportunities for a deer hunter. Whitetails and mule deer are found in many of the same areas. Mark Kaiser is in western South Dakota and facing that dilemma. With miles of whitetail bottoms to hunt and miles of breaks, Badlands country to hunt, I just was having a tough time. Whitetails or mule deer? Mule deer or whitetail? Which way should I go? I just couldn't get that limping buck out of my mind that I'd seen earlier in the hunt. He had a big frame, nice mature body. He'd likely do. So I made a plan. I devised a strategy to get that buck. I knew he was heading over towards that Badlands country and he liked to cross a big flat every morning. Getting a little earlier start this morning and it's a strategy you may want to use as you hunt deer. The strategy is to get into position before, way before the deer are gonna come through. Now you're always trying to cut deer off and that's what we're trying to do this morning. We're trying to circumnavigate, get around where they're gonna to go to. But a lot of times to get there, you gotta get in there way early before they come through. That morning though, it was a big surprise. It was cold. The temperature had been cool but not downright cold. It was almost zero as I took off in the dark, hiking after that buck, trying to get into a location where hopefully I would find him or even a better buck. Mind you, there were deer everywhere. And even though the rut was winding down, there was still some cruising going on. Exuberant young bucks and a few old timers trying to get in their last dating game for the year. I was getting a bit excited seeing all the does and I even got my spotting scope out from time to time to peer through the grass to see if I could see antler tips, but I wasn't seeing exactly what I wanted. I did see a few young bucks hanging out with the does, but no big bucks. The problem with every hunt is it's gotta end, and that thought was going through my mind. Now, I still had a little bit of time. Just then, after a little glassing down this canyon, I spied what I thought was a shooter buck. He was skirting the top of a canyon and going into some nasty rough country. He disappeared and I knew it was time to take action. If he headed out at the top of that draw, it was game over. He was gonna dump into some huge canyons with badlands and gullies that would take me weeks to dissect and figure out where he went. I put my boots into overdrive, hustled up the hill, slipped around the corner, and saw him. He was just getting ready to dive into some brush. I motioned, get down, get down for the cameraman. You know what, you always got a cameraman behind you when you're filming these shows, and just then, that buck turned to look at me and I knew everything was about to fall apart. Instead of letting him escape, I snapped into action with a snap shot, which I rarely do, but my mind told me the buck was in crosshair range. There was no distance estimation needed. I snapped my rifle up and sent a new Hornady ELD X bullet on its way. He just, he come boiling out of here. He was running up this draw. He was gonna head out one more time. <sighs> Looked like I made a good hit, but there's so much brush right up here. <sighs> Let's give him just a second. I didn't see him come out of there. <sighs> and things happen fast. <sighs> they happen fast. With the thump, that slap of a hit, I felt pretty good, but you still had that question in mind. Why? Well, the recoil of a 300 win mag, you don't get to see an animal drop. So when I came back with the sight picture, uh, there was nothing there. The brush, it was empty. The gully, it was empty. 
Had the buck slipped over the top? Had I missed? Calming myself down, I knew that I'd hit that buck solid. I knew there was a lot of brush, but had he made it over the top into the next series of canyons, why waste time? I reloaded, dialed my scope back down so I could have a good field of view just in case he jumped up and started right up that gully, not wasting time wanting to find my trophy before the sun set. I had my rifle ready, but I could tell with some fair certainty this dude was down for the count. And I slipped in beside him, ready to grab those big hefty antlers. He was exactly what I wanted. Deep forks, nice mass, and a huge mature body to boot. It's tough to find places these days where you can hunt that many mature bucks. But just thinking back as I held the rack of that buck, I must have I must have been seeing three, four, five mature bucks a day. A nice big five by five, deep forked mule deer buck. Mature, holy cow, look at the neck, neck on him. I can't believe the size of this thing. Well, I was living the dream, holding a trophy, experiencing some of the best country that I ever imagined I'd hunt. And, well, I'd gotten the job done right before the hunt ended. We've been seeing big bucks every day. This country is so rough and rugged. The cedar breaks, the big thick river bottoms, and they've been giving us, well, they've been giving us fits right and left, getting past us, getting out of sight before we can find them. And this deer was doing the same thing. He was ready to get out of Dodge City and booking it. The rut's winding down. I couldn't be happier with a buck like this because any day they're gonna shut down. In fact, I think today was a key factor day. They were definitely shutting down, locking down, and not locked down breeding, locked down because they're starting to get tired. The season's a day away from closing, and we've tagged a giant, big South Dakota mule deer. Dragging the buck back to the trail, well, it gave me time to reflect on why I like South Dakota. Sure, I'm a native of the state. I live next door in Wyoming now, but it's always fun to come back to a place. A place, well, that I kind of know as a good friend. A place where there's great crossover hunting for whitetails and mule deer. And a place where you can make some great memories like I did on this hunt in Western South Dakota. Coming up next, perfecting your setup in Growing Big and what you should be doing right now to get ready for the season. This is Land of Whitetail TV. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Cuddyback, more deer, fewer blanks. Analogix, protect your herd with the power of science. Thompson Center, America's master gun makers. Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. And by Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology. Apply, dry it, and go hunt. Growing Big with Steve Bartilla. When people think about habitat improvement, they think about food plots and for good reason. Food plots can make a big difference in your success. The problem that most people have though, is they don't go ahead and match the best food plot locations for their hunting conditions. Lots of times, you don't have to plant the holding plot. The holding plot's purpose is to go ahead and get deer to stay here. This is their destination food source. That takes a lot of acreage. And a lot of times it doesn't make a lot of sense. You've got a neighbor who's got a great big corn and soybean fields. Okay. Why do you want to go ahead and put corn and soybeans over on your ground? You're not going to stop them from going over there. You know, and you don't have 20 acres to put into food plots on your 40 acre property. So instead what you do is about 20 yards, 30 yards, 50 yards off that line fence. You go ahead and you create a little opening in the woods. Because Mr. Big, he's not willing to step foot out on that great big egg field during legal shooting lights, but he is willing to step foot out into that quarter acre, third acre, half acre staging plot before going in there.
It's a smartphone world for sure. That has its good and its bad points. The good point is the fact that your attention span now, it's basically seven seconds. That's five seconds less than it was in the year 2000. The bad thing about that is, well, you just get too engrossed in that smartphone. Let's go back to that good point. Why is it a good point, especially when you're toting your Matthews? Well, the average deer, when it comes through a window of opportunity, or you have a chance meeting or encounter, is only gonna give you fleeting seconds to get the shot off. So that's why you wanna practice, like I was right there, drawing back, anchoring, and letting loose. Not only do whitetails give you fleeting seconds, well, everything else does. Rarely does an elk, a pronghorn, a mule deer, or any other species give you just a lots of luxury of time to get that shot off. So like I'm doing right here, practice on real 3D targets so you mentally train your mind to shoot at a big game animal's vital spots, practice in real world environments like we're doing right here, and practice getting that shot off in seven seconds or less. Yeah, that smartphone, it is good for one thing, training you to be quick and get things done right away. Be sure to check deer and deer hunting out online and on Facebook.